Good. Um, hi, I'm Susanna, um, and I'm super excited Hello. to be introducing Tyree Day today. Um, so Tyree Day is a poet from Youngsville, North Carolina, a Kaveh Kahnem Fellow, and a teaching assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, he has published two poetry collections, the 2017 APR Hanikman First Book Prize winner, River Hymns, and 2020's Cardinal. Um, Day is the winner of numerous prizes and awards, including the 2019 Palm Beach Poetry Festival Langston Hughes Fellowship, the 2019 Diana and Simon Robb Writer in Residence at UC Santa Barbara, and the 2019 Whiting Writers Award. Day's work frequently centers his experiences with family, ancestry, Black boyhood, and masculinity in the South, and we absolutely loved reading River Hymns as one of the foundational texts to our poetry unit in class, and we were just so excited to have you with us here tonight. Um, so I'll hand it off to one of my friends who's going to start with the questions tonight. Hi, um, I'm Chloe, and I'm just going to kind of guide us through the questions tonight. Um, most of the students uh, wrote their own questions, so I'll just call their names. If they're here today, then they can ask you their own questions. And if not, then I'll just um, ask them for them. I've, I've really liked this uh, setup here. Okay. <laughs> I somewhat feel like I'm on some type of TV show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, let's, let's do it. All right, um, so the first question is from Nathan, who I don't think is here today, so I'll go ahead and ask it for him. Um, so how do you go about starting a poem? Do you purposely seek out sources of inspiration or do you draw from ideas from your own experiences? Uh, I don't, uh, I, okay, so I don't seek out, I don't think seek out is the right word for it. it's more I I start poems usually through an image that image uh can be something that happens in front of me all right presently or it could be through memory right? I remember something and then I usually try to put that image on paper and you know usually my imagination will spark right and I will either uh attempt to kind of make a world from that memory and build more or that image and deal more, or I'll attempt to make meaning from it. Um, or I'll do a little of both. Uh, but that's, you know, it's usually, it usually starts like that. And if I'm sitting down to write, you know, I'm very much looking for what's right there in front of me. So usually I'm outside um, or I'm walking and that's usually how it starts for me. And, and usually that image will lead to a memory. That, that's how it works for me. So. I'm in a neighborhood, so a group of kids will ride their bikes by, right? And I'll describe that. And then, of course, that will lead to a memory. And that's usually how poems get started for me. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is by Aaron. Aaron, if you want to ask your question. Yes, yeah, so my question's kind of similar, but more about your process in writing. How do you approach okay. it? And what do you think are your main inspiration subjects that you draw from? Mm, well, I like I like the subject part. Um, so I think of subject, I think of obsessions and symbols. Um, so a symbol, a big symbol of mine is definitely death. Uh, writing about death and imagining, I, I, imagining death right other possibilities uh nature uh, mostly through like birds um uh definitely through rivers right but not not so much now but definitely just nature in general it's just uh and tobacco i think that's a huge symbol in my work um my mother and grandmother um but i'm i umbrella then under uh, different kind of categories of symbols. So I usually umbrella my grandmother under the the umbrella of death, right? Like that larger kind of theme, the the how she shows up in the work. Um, I think of my mother showing up, showing up as a symbol is more of like I always think of language of the heart, right? That's the that's the language I'm interested in, right? To risk being sentimental in a poem, right? So you'll see like in my poems like I don't mind saying I love you and right? that's such a sentiment sentimental risk right in a poem um so those are my symbols uh right now my symbols I would definitely just say is neighborhoods in general 
and plant life and gardening. And because uh, I grew up in you know, neighborhoods where people had gardens in their backyards, right? And, and right now I'm really interested in neighborhoods. So that's, that's a really good symbol of mine. Right, yeah, it was definitely really interesting to see some of those symbols um, throughout uh, the River Hymns poem um, collection. Oh, so, so okay, I want to say though, because we, you all are going to get a writing prompt with me. So I want you all to start thinking about this for your own now. What are your symbols, right? And um, maybe before, if you if you have trouble with that, think about what is your narrative, right? Uh, where are where are you from? Who are you? Who were you raised by? And then maybe think about. Uh, this is going to connect to our prompt that I'm going to give you in a little bit, right? That that symbol, what is that symbol for you? And let it be a tangible thing, something you can put your hands on, right? Something you can touch. All right, so just, just start thinking about that, and I'll give you more when we get the prompt. Great. Um, the next question is by Pierce, if you want to ask your question. Yay. Sure. Yeah, I was curious how you go about writing a collection of poems so like do you outline it and then determine how most aspects will fit together before you start writing like you might with an essay or is it more like you write each poem one by one and then you allow the piece to come together by itself yeah it's definitely the opposite i'm definitely very far far away from thinking about an outline or like any kind of aspect of an essay um it's really just build writing a bunch of poems and then saying, oh, I'm tired of writing on these poems. What do I have? And then going through and seeing how the poems are talking to each other, right? And see how, you know, how they fit together as a collection. Um, it's all intuition, all of it, really. Um, it's also it's also craft, right? I, I read a lot. So I kind of know, I have an idea of how books can work, right? And how to kind of break that expectation too. Uh, but it's also intuition. And it just, um, I, I wanted to, uh, I should have pulled this out. I was, I've been thinking about how important this, the Triggering Town essay uh, was to me, Richard Hugo's Triggering Town essay. And this idea of like intuition and like, you know, he gives the example of jazz, right? Like jazz players, you get to the point where you study so much, right? And you, and you pay attention to craft so much that when you just do it, you just do it, right? And you have all your tools just naturally come out. And, and it's kind of, it's the same thing. We read the Triggering Town last week. Yeah. Um, so they, so they're, they're a little familiar with that. Yeah. Oh, nice. So great. Uh, this, and this uh, connects back with the, um, with the prompt as well. You know, if you want to grow that idea, you can think about other symbols, but also think about, you know, what town, right? If you if you have that triggering town, where where do all these kind of where do you go to play with your obsessions, right? That's your triggering town. And so start thinking about that. And I love that idea because, you know, we're gonna take our hometown really, but we're gonna build something else, right? And that's what I really love to do, to kind of take Youngsville, because that's, you know, Cardinal and Riverham, just Youngsville. I'm just now, now that I have it in my hands, I can just make magic, right? That, that's what we do. Uh, cool. Was Did you ask your question? Did I answer it? <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. You did. Right. Um, the next question is by Troy, who I don't think is here. Um, but he asks that, um, so we recently talked about a few poetry exercises to do when the writing process gets difficult. Are there any exercises you do when you're having a hard time writing poetry and how do these help with your creative process? Well, um, I guess, what do you mean by difficult? Um, I guess probably oh, I guess the Troy, writer's I block. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what he means, but I assume like writer's block yeah. or you can't quite find the words. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't really, oh, I'm probably, I'm glad that I'm not, you know, I don't mind losing friends or making enemies. I don't really believe in writer's block. I uh, put some words out on the page if it ain't good, it's not good, right? You need bad drafts too, 
You know, I don't really know what that. I don't like. This is me being really serious. I have no idea what writing block means. Like, put words. You can write a sentence, right? It's not like you lost the ability at the moment to write a sentence. So write something. It's just not good at the moment. That's okay. So yeah, uh, we'll tell Troy that when we see him next in class. Yeah, thank um, you. That's really interesting. Um. The next question is, what does the editing process look like for poetry and how do you decide when a poem is finished? I think of, oh, I I was thinking before, just in case I was asked, because I I have, well, I think of a good line. Uh, So first thing, right, is every line in the poem working? And that's, is every line, does every line mean and sing? Right? I think a good line should mean something and should sing. Uh, how you sing, right, and your notes is a whole different kind of conversation. But a, a good poem should mean and sing. Um, and also, right, that that's the idea of every line working, but also this idea of line in and line break. So can I pull, if I just, you know, the first line or the middle of a, a poem, every line should be working. Right? I should be able to pull them out individually or stand on their own, right? So they're, they're, every line is dependent right, uh, on each other in the poem, but they also can stand by themselves. And that's kind of where you want to get to. That's what I look for in a good poem. Um, when I think about a, a poem, is a poem done? I, I don't know. I really try to go back and recognize the larger metaphor of the poem, right? So what is the larger metaphor of this poem? Um, is it clear? Um, and that's really a matter of not me trying to write it, but it's usually the best when the poem, right? When you just recognize it, when it surprises you, right? When it surprises you, you know it's going to surprise the reader. Um, I look for that. I like the ending of my poem. So it's two ways I always think of it. And these are two things I was I was told by my teacher, Dorian Locks. Um, a poem should... I'm going to misquote her, so I'm just going to say how I usually say it. Um, okay, I think of a poem and it's like a door opening. So you get to the end of a poem and it's like you walk through a door and it's kind of like this. Like anything can happen now, right? Um, I also think of the ending of a poem as, as like the ringing of a bell and like how those waves kind of go out. Uh, that's usually how I think about the ending of the poem. I know that is very like, that, you know, again, this is art that we're kind of talking about that, but that's what I try to get to. So, but the way to pull it off the kind of ground is just some craft. I end my poems with an image, right? Um, you know, something for us, something for the reader to sit inside of, right? Um, that I think that usually gives me that effect of the bell. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, the next question is by Ethan. If you want to ask your question, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Hi, uh, my question for you is, um, how did you first get started as a poet? And were you also interested in other literary forms when you first started writing or did you initially gravitate towards poetry? Mm. Yeah, I wrote short stories uh, in middle school. <laughs> That's so funny just to say now I'm thinking about. But yeah, I was writing, and I actually, I remember those stories and I enjoy them. They're always just adventure stories. Um, some, always some idea of travel. There's, there was always a train, um, so short stories. And then I started writing really bad poems junior year, maybe junior or senior year of high school, I don't really remember. And, uh, you know, I wasn't the best student, but I like to write. Um, and I also was in marching band all four years of high school. And so um, I think that, I think that also supported my writing, but that's another conversation. Um, but I, I like writing, and I was like, well, I want to go to college, and I figured, I found out you can major in creative writing. I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. Um, <laughs> all right, this is my way to go to college, right? Because, you know, that's what I've been told. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, so I did that, and then I ended up at NC State um, and met the poet Rob Green, who's the editor of Raleigh Review, a literary arts magazine uh, here in North Carolina, here in Raleigh. 
And I met Dorian Lopes, who's my teacher, and you know, really just everything kind of happened from there. I went to grad school at NC State with Dorian, and then I met other poets like Eduardo C. Corral, Bobby Francis, um, John Balaban, all these poets I got to study with. And you know, other places like Kaveh Khanum that I can't forget, right? I wouldn't have my first two book my, my first two books without Kaveh Khanum. I, you know, really, I think I found, I, I say this, I think I've said this before, I found the path, right, of the book. Right? I think I, I figured out what both of my books were about, right, what I was trying to write uh, at Kaveh Khanum. So that was a, was a kind of how I got started, I guess. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is by Davis, who is not here, so I'll read it for him. Um, so while reading through some of the sections of River Hymns, I notice that each poem differs in structure and layout. Some, like Green's, appears more conventional, while Strike the Stone visually looks more abstract and free-flowing. What is your thought process when deciding on the layout of each line and word of the poem, and what impression do you hope to leave the reader, leave on the reader with each specific layout? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, when I was writing River Hymns, I was really interested in, and I'm not necessarily that way now, but I felt like the tone of River Hymns, that it made sense for there to be a lot of air between the lines. Like, tone-wise, that fits. Because it's like, it's magic, it's also sentimental, and there's a lot of, I don't know, but I'll, even Cardinal, right, same way. There's a lot of risk, right? I'm risking right uh a lot in those poems and i don't know kind of those open i want people to spend time with my lines right and i think that uh that air between the lines help, right, helps them kind of really sit with the line um also you know something i was told when building you know river hymns is my my thesis my mfa thesis so something i was told when building river hymns was you know you know uh First thing someone's going to do at the bookstore is pick up your book and do this. And, you know, you want them, you want every poem to look different on the page, right? Um, mm -hmm. But also that makes sense because I, I want, and I don't mean this in like, that I made like concrete poems, but I like for my lines to try to somehow fit with what the image is doing, right? So if I tell you that we're flying, Maybe then, like, there's a lot of air between the lines. So, um, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is by Hannah. If you want to ask your question, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Um, sorry, my dog is barking like crazy, but I will send the question. That's okay. <laughs> so, here. Oh, no, I don't mind. But I have a dog. You can, I don't mind barking. Dog. Yeah, you can, you can have your dog bark, too. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's my question in the chat. So, do you want to read it for us? Okay, sure. Yeah. So while we don't we don't mind a dog barking. We really don't. Um. So while reading River Hymns, I was curious why you touched on rivers and water as often as you did. Do they symbolize something deeper? You know. Um. So we've been talking about symbols and metaphors. Uh, I don't know who I, I don't know who asked the question about putting together a book, but that was you know if I'm remembering this correctly, that was a symbol that I didn't even recognize in the book, which I know is ridiculous to even think about, right? With how many rivers there are. But that wasn't a necessarily a symbol that I was, in the beginning, you know, bringing out. Um, when it was pointed out to me, I was like, oh, I, I see that now. And then I started to, to make more meaning out of it, right? And really try to develop it as a obsession and symbol but I think it makes sense also, I don't know, you know, I grew up around, you know, the Noose River was just below our neighborhood, right? So I had this association with water as a child and also this danger around water. I don't, I've been thinking about, is that a Southern thing, right? Maybe because there is water around, but, or if you can just go up around water, you you know, whoever raised you, they kind of teach you about water, right? And these, how to act and behave, right? In water and around water. And I, I think that's a big part of my like growing up as well. 
Great, uh, thank you. So the next question is my question. Um, so when growing up, did you know that the river and the water where you were raised would have such an impact on you? Or was it something that took reflection as an adult to realize its significance in your life? And then additionally, when you were going to write this collection, did you know that you wanted to write about the river or was it more something that came to you as you started writing? So definitely like came to me as, as I was writing. I'm thinking about that first question. Um, I feel like there were, there were moments when I was a child, like walking in the woods, where you like look up in the woods and you like feel this like magical thing. You know what I mean? I, don't ne I didn't necessarily know I would go on to write poems, but I, I think I did recognize there was like magic in nature. Um, so I think it makes sense. Um, and I think we, we, right, I think we all might remember those, those things as a kid. Mm, that, that makes sense, right? A lot of things are magic as, uh, when we were children. And that's the same, right? That's the same magic, um, I'm interested in. Something I was thinking about today as well is like, what, well, I, I think my voice is very much a child's voice in both of these books, right? I think so. Um, though there's some adult things, but I think it's still very childlike. It's still very much like these people are older. I'm like watching as a child, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will always be my voice. Um, I think I'm still very much interested in my childhood and writing through those years. That's just something I was thinking about as well. Cool. Let's give you all. Is that all the questions? I want to hear. I want to see you all think and write now. Um, we have three more questions. Okay. No rush. Let's let's do it. Um, so the next question is by Susanna, if you want to ask your question. Yes, let me pull it up. Are you doing that? I'm going to, I'm going to find an essay I want to share with you all. All right. Um, I'll give you a second to do that then. Okay, one second. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready whenever you are. Sure. Um, so I noticed when reading River Hymns, like you said, that the the voice was that primarily of a child um, uh, experiencing their, you know, their growth in adolescence. And I noticed that a lot of it had to do with your experiences, you know, with boyhood versus manhood um, and like black masculinity. And frequently there were, you know, father, uncle or other authority figures that you, you know, repeatedly brought up during your writing. Um, so how did you approach writing your relationships with these male figures? Um, was it intentional or was it just the byproduct of your, you know, creative uh process oh yeah i was looking at that uh question you know i definitely think it's the byproduct of telling the truth i think that's what it is right it's the byproduct of, of telling the truth like that the, i don't know i think my, my work does examine those relationships even in cardinal as well um I don't know. I, I think it's I think it's something that like my subconscious is interested in, and I'm just following that. Um, it really exploring that relationship. It reminds me of a new poem um, that I have about shooting a bird from a tree as a child um, with a bunch of uncles, right, and and uh, cousins, right, in my family. Um, but yeah. All right, um, our next question is by Alyssa. Do you wanna ask your question? Okay, yeah, um, some of this might be repeat on topics you've touched on, but my question was, many of your poems we looked at in class touched on death in some shape or form. When putting together a collection of poetry, do you have a central theme in mind as you write or did this topic emerge through your writing as something important to you? And what drives your fascination to exploring death in all its natural forms? 
Yeah, I don't know. This is bad, but I don't. It's not that I don't remember River Hymns. Just haven't looked at it in a long time. I want to say I, I, the the theme of death is larger in Cardinal, but I guess that that's not necessarily true. Um, I don't know. My obsession with death is something, or the, or the reason why is something I didn't realize until just uh, listening to Mary Ruffles' twenty eight short lectures. She talks about this idea of being a complete human being, and I think like so the idea that when none of us are complete human beings because we're not dead yet, and the reason that poets are interested in death because they're interested in what it means to be human, and they want to know what it means to be a complete human being, right? And so this idea to reach to the other side because there's so much mystery in it, right? It's something we don't know about, and so we have all these questions, and I think that's the reason why. I think the reason why I'm constantly talking to my my ancestors because I'm terrified of death and I think I want to not gain some knowledge of the other side, but like just be protected while I'm here. Um, and I think that's why I go to them a lot in my work. Um, oh, um, at the beginning of Lee Young Lee's reading, um, at lunch poems um, on YouTube, he talks about the dying breath, and that uh, when you when you inhale, uh, he, he talks about our bones get stronger, uh, and when we exhale, our bones weaken, and that's he calls that the dying breath. And so poetry, right, is verse, and it's done with the dying breath. And so maybe that's another reason why we're obsessed with death, which I think is just really cool um, to think about. Great. Um, so we do have one more question, but I do think you you already answered it while we were speaking. Um, so if you want to go ahead and move on to the exercises that you had prepared, um, you're more than welcome to. It was definitely a pleasure to hear you speak and answer all of our questions um, and just to kind of have a face and voice to go with the poems we've been reading. So thank you. Hey, I'm going to say something I probably shouldn't say on Facebook Live. I, you know, I work at UNC. But I'm a Duke basketball fan, and I tell them all the time. Uh, I tell them that usually on the first day, I let them know. Isn't that hilarious? Um, but I've been, you know, with Duke basketball since a child, so I don't know. What, what am I supposed to do? Um, uh, Quante, well, yeah, Quante is in the opposite opposite boat over there, so. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so. I'm a UNC alum, that's why. Okay, okay, okay. I like I like NC State football. <laughs> okay, so here's uh here's the prompt. So we've been, you know, like I said, okay, I wanted to read this first. Uh I'll just read this opening. Uh the poet Vavi Francis introduced the concept of entering the cave of oneself uh to me during my grad school years at North Carolina State University. Bobby encouraged me to explore my narrative, to investigate my symbols, to break them open and to look inside of them. My narrative is that I'm black, Southern, raised by a single mother. Uh, I'm from a working class family and, mo and I'm a husband. Uh, knowing my narrative helps me understand why tobacco fields and dirt roads show up in my poems. By identifying and exploring my symbols, I can begin to telescope inside of them making the language I speak about them fresh and discover why these symbols were given to me. I believe our images come from God and all our egoless souls trying to make us see our connection to the world. Uh, so thinking about that, right? Thinking about your symbols um, and, and maybe even, right, you can, symbols, obsessions. Uh, I want you to, okay. Uh, when you think of your childhood, what tangible item do you think of, right? Maybe it's a uh, a toy. Maybe it's like uh, the swing set out back. Maybe it's, right, uh, maybe it's a bike. What tangible item do you think of, okay? That's the first part. Part two, I want you to write a poem that describes a memory 
with that tangible item, okay? Follow the poem where it wants to go, even if it's outside of that memory. And then the last part, I want you to attempt to make meaning from that memory, right? Let that memory teach you something. Let, attempt to see something in that memory that you right, didn't see before. Okay, and here I like to I like to give words and a phrase and a color, um, and so here they are. All right, I won't be writing them down, so you gotta listen. Oh, okay, this is what someone in the well, someone maybe one of the students in the chat. All right, when you hear the words, just put them in there. That's a good idea. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. First word: hands. Second word, door. Home. Twins. River. Jar, a uh, jar like uh, like a like a jar jam. Um, path. I like yes. half the moon. Oh, okay. Healed, like uh, my wound is healed. Buckle. Oh, and that could be the last word. And then there's the phrase. The phrase is, I understand why you blank. And then you fill in the blank. And then someone give us a color. Green. There we go, green. Um, all right, any questions about the prompt? So um, you can take that with you. I would love to, and since we, um, I don't know, this is going to be ridiculous what you, what you hear me about to say. I don't know where my copy of River Hymns is, so I only have a copy of Cardinal. So I'm going to read from Cardinal. You all, is that okay? Do I read poems? All right. Um, oh, well, that would be awesome because we all, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't in introduce them to Cardinal. Um, we we really just looked at River Hymns, so that that would be great to give them. Okay. Cool. Um, I just read, I just read like two or three, okay, uh, just to get a sense of the book. Uh, so this is my second book of poems that I wrote while in Lenox, Massachusetts, at this place called the Amy Clampett Residency. Uh, it's about, uh, it's a book about. Traveling while black, but also about leaving, how to leave home, how to leave and return home, really. Um, a lot of traveling. Okay, cool. I'll start with the first poem of the book, uh, Field Notes on Leaving, Geography Could Not Save Me. Jacqueline Johnson, Jacqueline Joan Johnson quoted by Is uh, Isabel Wilkerson in The Warmth of Other Suns. The North Star is irrelevant miles and miles above my head. I don't want constellations any nearer. I know there are whole cities all over this country so bright you can't see the stars, the sky no wider than the heart is wide. The night President Obama was elected, we danced in the street of our small university to my president is black, my first time on my own. I was bright and felt like I had a father. Every one of us was flying. A blunt passed around, we got lifted. My heart to lift, all the world explore. If there were stars, we could hold them. I've never been through airport security without being pulled to the side and searched. To know you can die anywhere doesn't feel like flying anywhere. I can't go to Canada and leave my mama here alone. If you see me dancing a two-step, I'm sending a starless cold. We're escaping everywhere. I can't afford to think like Whitman, that whomever I meet on the road I shall love, and whoever beholds me shall love me. Doing the Dougie, trying to find the ocean, looking everywhere. By land. 
I lived on dirt roads that bent and ended at a gate of pines. The dust skipped up, didn't make my mother look like a dream I've lived on roads that dragged through America. I paced only them to the next town. The road we kissed on is gone, rich folks buying up all the city in which we make do. I miss when Sonny could do a willy all the way down Person Street and no one would call the police because he was a part of the neighborhood like the honeysuckle bush between two yards and he was beautiful, not like a horse standing alone in a yellow field, but like a man is beautiful. Most of the little towns have a road nicknamed Devil's Turn, where someone's brother died on a Saturday night while Nina sang Tell Me More and More and then some on the caddies radio, the moon the color of the oldest cardinal. Every, every road isn't a way out. Some circle back like wolves. You can't get lost on them and they won't lose you. Others wait for you to run out of gas. They come alive with what your mother said would take you. Every road promises something like a father does. But when you arrive, the town is empty and you wait like a child questioning everything. The road itself laughing like a drunk man falling into a roadside ditch. The road I'm walking now. It's howling and full of moon. Hopefully it will lead to myself. Hopefully they'll take me home. Cool, one more and I'll let you all go. Tomorrow's Friday, students. I know you're so excited. You got the weekend coming up. Make smart decisions. That's what I tell my students, especially over the weekend. Please make smart decisions. Okay, uh, one more poem. I, I'll read this poem since we talk about um the day quite a bit. Leave yourself all over for Grandmother Carrie. Teach me to love the way only the dead know. Sometimes I want to see you so badly, I dream myself full of the reddest wings. I do the things I promised my mother I'd never do again. You wouldn't recognize me now or the town. Three highways run through old tobacco land. I weep all night for you, will not stop, no matter the bright purple festivals, the fireworks that scare everything from the sky. On my way to visit your grave, where you're buried beside your lonesome son, who walked Youngsville all day like an angel, no one would give proper wings. I wanted to see you in that small town, where our last name watered a crop of sore beans, labored under a white man's promise. I wanted to see you in that wild graveyard as a cardinal. When I arrived, I wanted there to be jubilee, chalk red feathers darting the sky like a little blood moon. I think I'll never be through with the dead. My art are full of whole other worlds. When you no longer ghost among your children, grandchildren, when you become fully angel, a bird I let loose in my house. Will you still remember us in our Jerry rigged lives? I know it's hard work being dead. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. That was that was super great. Um, real quick before we go, I just want if anybody has questions like that's not the questions you prepared ahead of time, but something that occurred yeah. to you. Um, I know that that um, I was just thinking that before we let you go, I wanted to make sure to get from you. Um, anybody you've been reading lately or that you'd recommend, is there, you know, yeah, um, some pieces or some, or some people who we just shouldn't be missing out on their work right now? Yeah, uh, there's, there is, sorry, my desk is gross. Uh, <laughs> okay. Sorry, there's a book, uh, Un-American, that I would recommend. Cool. And I can take notes and I can put these up for, for the rest of y'all to, I can put these on Sakai. Um, yeah, but um, I, I'm, this is a, this is not a new book. I'm, a, I'm always recommending this book of poems, The January Children. Okay, awesome. Um, Ross Gay's new book, Be Holding, is amazing. Um, 
Uh, I'm looking for what else am I reading? Oh, I want a uh, Randall's book if I had two wings. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, I was looking for that one book, Un American, because I just love it so, so much. It's so good. Um, but yeah, those are the books I'm really thinking about now. Um, oh. Erica Foreman's book, uh, Salt Body Shimmer. Take a minute out here. Salt Body Shimmer is really great. Okay, awesome. Cool. I'll write. I'll I'll put those on the guys so that um, everybody can check those out. Is anybody anything that occurred to you, you know, over the past forty five minutes that you? Want to bring up? I would love to hear someone's symbols. So if you want to share your symbols and obsessions and where, you, where you're following them to or what questions you have about them. I'll talk about mine a little bit. So yeah. I am from, my whole family is from South Texas, close to the border. Um, and so like very Mexican and very, very country people, which is kind of like a subculture that I don't think lots of people know about, um, ranchers, uh, primarily and, or like nowadays oil field workers. And most of my like childhood symbols and the ones that I see stacking back up whenever I write tend to be the swing set in my backyard that my grandfather made uh the roses that he planted they're yellow uh and then lots of like things that are accurate to my experience but that I think are like becoming cliche in like diaspora poetry that I see all the time like things like rosaries and crosses and candles with saints on them uh and you know tortillas and other like I, I try so, to like be accurate to my experience, but also sometimes I feel like, especially if you're like a writer of color, it's hard to talk about yourself in ways that aren't like the sort of self exoticizing type of way that I see a lot, especially in like the older poets or like if you read like House on Mango Street, sometimes I'll be writing something and I'll be like, I just rewrote House on Mango Street. Um, and so, but, but. You know, you can't, you don't choose your symbols of obsessions, right? Um, and what kind of comes to, but, but what you're saying is true. What you have to do is make it fresh. Mm -hmm. How do you make the language fresh? How are you, right? And I think it's a matter of questioning, right? It's, it's possibly questioning your symbols, questioning the beliefs you have around your symbols, right? How do they become your symbols? And asking them why. It is really just asking your symbols why. That's literally what I'm doing over and over, right? And those whys are revealed through different things, right? Um, but I definitely don't. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm I sorry. just remembered a few others that I thought were actually a little bit more. Um, like, that region is very interesting. And, like, the people who live there are very interesting because, like, for the majority of us, we're, like, Native people that were there and then got colonized and then got colonized again. And so there's this, like, deep devotion to the land, even though not much grows there and the land is sandy and, like, clay-filled. People are, and, like, you can't drink the water because it's poisoned, but people are still very much devoted to the land and have this, like, this this longing for the earth that predates us by many many generations and that's something that I see in my writing very frequently but that I haven't like named until now what do you mean by name I guess oh, oh I, I, I I know what you mean um I wanted to ask you know it seems like you already have your world right it's just a matter of you really just spending some time with your obsessions in that world right and making and we create the freshness, right? We can make magic through metaphor, and so just make magic, make them, right? Um, make your these these uh, maybe these symbols you see a lot, right? Make them new, right? You you make them new, and you just right, you keep building, and that's that's the great part of it, right? To to watch someone make something new out of the same thing we have for a while, right? And that's the power of metaphor. That's why I love metaphor so much. Great. Others, you want to share your symbols? I 
I call him, you know, a peach too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Volunteers without calling someone? Uh, yeah, I can. I got you. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go um, ahead, Sophia. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just one of the one of the biggest things I feel like I found this semester and a lot of the writing I've been doing uh, is the ocean. I grew up in California, so um, I feel like that's kind of almost a generic thing um, because a lot of people would rely on that or you know like talking about the sun all the time because that's something that most Californian people are very used to. Um, but I felt like. For me, I always thought, oh, the ocean doesn't really affect me. You know, I thought kind of I abused uh, living in California. I didn't appreciate it. And then now in my writing, I feel like uh, it's coming up all the time. Like I've used it to do dream tank sequences. I've used it in my poetry. Um, I feel like it's kind of become something very versatile for me. And I just, it's just something I've tried to work with more. Hey, I love the hear that you're working with it. I don't like to hear you all talk down about your symbols. Um, don't these these this is literally all we have right um i love that you have the ocean because i was and, and you said the word dream because i was thinking about a triggering town of the ocean right and the I, I was thinking about a place for a speaker to go to be safe right um and i was sort of like kind of leaving this world and like jumping into the ocean and you know, like literally doing that in a poem i thought i, don't know, I love that idea and then what what would that really mean, right? Like literally what would that mean? Where does the speaker go? And what does that look like? Go uh, how do how do we get in the ocean? I just love that the idea of a triggering child in the ocean. Cool. So I hope you all do these props and um you know, start building and thinking about these obsessions and symbols. Yeah. Um, we yeah. So and I've I've um taken what's here in the chat and I've copied it down too, so that in case anybody didn't didn't catch that, we will um we'll work on those over the next week. Um, yeah. This has been so. We're so grateful, Tyree. This has been like so wonderful. We really enjoyed talking about your poems last week, but it's so nice to to have the person who wrote the poems too. Yeah, when, you know, when we're all back on our campuses, I would love to come down the road and have a visit with you all. And then y'all can come down the road and have a visit with us, you know, at least in creative Yeah, writing. I want, I, I mean, that that speaks to something I've I've had hopes for, for for a little while. I mean, I haven't taught at Duke for that long. And then, of course, the pandemic came along. But I would love to build up more ties between um the programs and um, to have this, you know, have everybody feel like they have a larger creative writing community that spans both campuses. I think it's so cool that both schools are so close and there's like so much that could be done with that, so. And then we can go down the road to Raleigh and get those, those Wolfpack folks. Yes, yes, that would be amazing. We should work on that, yeah. Thank you all. It's been really fun. Um, it's always nice to get to talk craft. That's my favorite thing to do. <laughs>